Okay, so we're on to panel two. Um, so we have two two papers and a discussion as before. Uh, I guess we'll we'll go based on the program. Um, so first up from uh, Harvard Kennedy is Justin De Benedictus Kessner. Thanks so much, uh, and those are a great couple of first papers. Um, so I'm excited to be launching off here on our second panel. Um, but I'm going to discuss with you guys a project uh, based on a little bit of different data. Uh, but something that I'm really welcoming some feedback from all of you on. Uh, so I, I just want to start off talking about uh, Susan Collins because uh, this week <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about Susan Collins again. Um, but this is a picture of her in Donald Trump's first impeachment hearing. I'm not sure I ever thought I'd have to say that. Uh, but this is right after she votes to acquit Donald Trump on his first impeachment charges. She votes in line with many of her Republican colleagues uh, to do so. Right afterwards, of course, she's then uh, talking to reporters and they ask her about her vote. And, and she says, I believe that the president has learned from this case, which is potentially funny now, potentially not funny now, um, given that he's now been impeached a second time. But what I would call this, Susan Collins voting in line with her Republican colleagues, but then speaking afterwards in a manner that is what I would call more moderate, is something along the lines of strategic partisan communication. And this type of communication we know is actually quite common. Uh, politicians are often trying to appeal to their voters and often trying to present themselves in a way that is most advantageous for potential future elections. And Susan Collins is probably pretty common in, in, this, in this type of behavior. But the question that I wanna answer in this paper is actually how do politicians strategically communicate their specifically their partisan brands? How does someone like Susan Collins present this potentially more moderate version of herself or more extreme version of herself to her constituents? And I wanted to know this, the answer to this question in, in cities um, because like many of you, I, I like studying local politics. I think it's particularly interesting. Um, but the question that I get about this type of research often, um, because it's a phenomenon we see in national politics that I'm curious about in, in local politics, is why cities? And I probably don't have to sell that to this group here, but I think cities are especially important for something uh, like communication and political communication. Specifically, cities are important in their own right. They, they spend a lot of money, um, and they're the majority of elected officials in the U.S. So we might think if uh, certain phenomena of, of democracy that we normatively care about, like accountability or representation matter anywhere, they should matter for this you know, majority of, of officials that are elected in the US. But they're also an especially good place to study this specific question, um, specifically because there's recent evidence that the partisanship of government leaders does influence policy on the one hand. So people, uh, at least at the margins, are moving policy towards their, uh, their partisans' direction. But uh, the divisions among parties, the divisions between parties are, are less clear and often uh, because of nonpartisan elections, we might actually expect that uh, government leaders are, are going to present less partisan versions of themselves in the way that perhaps the, par the partisan differences we're getting and we're seeing in policy are only marginal or, or only small. So I'm going to tell you two different things in this paper. One of which is that local politicians do communicate about uh, rather mundane things in a way that's really different from how we see national politicians communicate, uh, especially with their press releases. And it's they do so in a way that makes it really hard to distinguish partisanship relative to national politicians. And I'm gonna show you that local politicians communication is more and less partisan depending on the electoral environment. So depending on the characteristics of their constituency, specifically their partisanship and their ideology, and how aligned those politicians are with that partisanship and ideology, politicians at the local level are gonna communicate in a slightly different way. In a way that I'm gonna suggest might potentially threaten accountability because it potentially shields them from this type of matchup between their communication and their policies. On so uh, why might this matter? You guys probably uh, thinking of, of normatively why politicians communication matters at all. This is my, my mayor, Marty Walsh in Boston here, signing actual legislation. And this is you know, the main thing we know about what politicians do that's really important is they, they make policies and they sign legislation and actually enact things. Um, and a really simple model of accountability would say that politicians make policies that voters then receive and voters can then uh, hold them accountable for the quality of those policies, the type of policies that they get by rewarding or punishing them in regular elections. 
But of course, politicians do a lot of other things. Here, Marty Walsh is speaking publicly about uh, the bill that he just passed. But as I started out with talking about Susan Collins, politicians communicate often in a way that's not necessarily the same as their policy. So while voters could hold politicians accountable for policy pretty easily if they knew exactly what policies were that politicians are passing, this type of communication that politicians engage in could be different and it could affect voters in a way that disrupts this information environment. And it actually might cause voters to make decisions that are not quite the same as if they had a fully informed view of policies. We know that politicians do this at the national level. There's lots of research. I'm just going to mention sort of two, two specific uh, pieces of research on this here. We know that they, politicians engage in a representational style by which they uh, try to present themselves to constituents in a certain way, depending on who their audience is. And we know that electoral motivations can factor into this from more recent research showing that indeed when they're more marginal, when politicians are more electorally threatened, they might engage in this type of communication in a different way and stake different types of policy positions uh, when they're less marginal, when they're more safe versus talk about more safe, uh, safe topics that are non-policy oriented when they're more marginal politicians. And I would sort of typify this as fitting into this theory of accountability and how communication fits in here uh, as something that could, again, disrupt accountability potentially. And Justin Grimmer sort of says that this is along this, this dimension of uh, politicians talking about either uh, policy or appropriations as sort of like the goodies that they give back to voters versus the actual policy positions they're taking. Um, but I, I actually am going to uh, align this along a different sort of spectrum here, which is just one that's, that's more or less partisan, which I'd, I'd say is probably a simplification of what Justin Grimmer says about national politicians. But I think it's just one way of viewing political communication uh, along one sort of uh, spectrum. And the question that I'm going to answer again today is whether or not politicians who are, who are Democrats, so different political parties, engage in a different type of communication towards voters than politicians who are Republican. So specifically, just are the types of communications from politicians at the local level of different parties, are they different? And does that difference, does that degree of difference between Republican and Democratic politicians depend upon their, their sort of electoral characteristics of the city that they're in? To do this, I'm going to use some data on municipal press releases, which I gather um, from 50 of the largest cities in the US which I scraped from city websites and then supplemented by contacting these city governments as well. And these span at the largest 1989 to 2017, but also for many, many cities, these are much, much smaller time spans because what the city had available was much smaller. I'm also gonna bring in some variables on that local electoral environment, specifically the partisanship, uh, their democratic vote share and their most recent presidential elections, just one way of looking at this, as well as their ideology from many different surveys collected by the Tosanovich and Warshaw MRP uh, from the uh, National Election Study and the CCES. And then I'm gonna use a couple of different uh, tools in this research design toolbox to look at this. Specifically, I'm gonna use supervised machine learning classifiers that try to separate uh, press releases, the body of press releases from a given mayoral administration into Democratic versus Republican press releases. And uh, I'm essentially going to go through this process many times of training different types of classifiers. Today, I'm just gonna show you uh, results from SVM support vector machines, but this also works if you use logistic regression with various penalties as well as lasso. Um, and so I could, I'm happy to talk about those later, but uh, the main results I'm gonna focus on here are from SVM. And that, what SVM does is it essentially just tries to, again, like regression, which we're all pretty familiar with, separate different classes, in this case, two classes, two partisan brands of politicians from their data, specifically their press releases. And I'm gonna uh, just use press releases in the, the count of words in press releases, just the raw count. Uh, there's other fancier ways of doing this, such as, uh, looking at bigrams, looking at topics, but I'm just gonna show you results from the most basic models here. I'm then gonna look at the individual level accuracy to get a measure of how partisan each individual mayoral administration is by looking at how accurate these machine learning classifiers are over repeated runs. So when running these classifiers many, many times, how accurate those classifiers are at predicting an individual level mayor's partisanship. 
The data come from, uh, again, a variety of large cities. These aren't just concentrated in one region of the country. Um, these are places like Oakland, places like New York City, places like Jacksonville, Florida. So they really range across the political spectrum, allowing me to get a good measure of uh, different types of partisan communications. So these aren't just big cities where only Democrats are in power, is what I'm trying to show you here. And here's sort of a really broad time uh, timeline look at what this is. Uh, so along the cities, along the vertical axis here, and then the, across time along the horizontal axis here, um, these are really small points, one point for each press release that's issued by a government. And what you could see is, again, these uh, vary a lot depending on the city. So Seattle, for instance, has tons and tons of press releases spanning more than 20 years, whereas cities uh, like Fresno are much less frequent in their press releases, and I only have an abbreviated time span that's not the entirety of this period. I'm still going to be able to break up these data into individual mayoral administrations and look at each mayoral administration. So in most cities, a four year period of their press releases and use this as the data on which I'm training these classifiers. Cities talk about a lot of things in these press releases. This is just a, a really basic frequency based word cloud showing that cities mostly talk about themselves. They talk about their mayors. Uh, they talk about their streets. Uh, they talk about various programs that the cities are engaging in, um, but it's really mundane stuff. If you read a lot of these press releases, you uh, probably start to fall asleep eventually because um, these aren't exciting policy uh, proposals. These aren't exciting stances about things that we hear about in the news. These are things like street closures and repaving for the most part. Some of these are about crime, really salient topics such as uh, initiatives to bring crime down. Some of these are about uh, new new businesses opening up and things that we are we think are really important from a sort of old school urban politics literature about the uh, economic development motivations of government. Some of these are also again really really mundane things like sewer overflows. But then some of them are really exciting uh, and fun and cute in that some of the, some governments actually talk a lot about pets that have to get adopted. This is this is Adam, a, a uh, service dog who is available for adoption uh, at some point at the shelter. And so cities engage in a lot of things that we wouldn't ever expect, say, your member of Congress to engage in in a press release. Yeah, there are sort of symbolic things that national level politicians do uh, in terms of naming a uh, you know an annual day in in honor of a certain person or other symbolic things like that, but. Local government press releases are, for the majority, of these rather symbolic and, and valence level issues rather than policy level issues, or at least that's how I'd characterize these. I'm going to show you some basic differences here uh, of how press releases look between different parties, specifically between Democratic uh, politicians and Republican politicians on the right, uh, just what the most frequent words are. And so what you see here is I've replaced place the city name in each of these press releases with just the, um, the token city name here so you can tell these apart except and it won't just show differences based on this particular city. But most of what cities uh, mayors talk about is pretty mundane stuff again. They're talking about parks, they're talking about communities, they're talking about public streets, um, and they're talking about themselves. They're talking about the mayors. Often these are public proclamations of what's already happened um, or the mayor is using it as a way to talk about some new initiative that they're bringing up. Of course, this is just a really basic look at partisan differences. What you can notice is probably there are a lot of the same words that these politicians use between parties. So I next moved to this approach of using supervised classification uh, to try to divide the press releases of uh, Republican and Democratic politicians. What this process basically does, I'm just gonna show you a really stylized uh, view of what supervised classification does, um, is it takes labels for existing documents, in this case, press releases. I have a lot of press releases from Democrats, a lot of press releases from Republicans. I know the labels of all of those because uh, I know the partisanship of all of the mayors in these data sets. What I'm gonna do to do supervised classification uh, to see how well we can predict the the partisanship of local government leaders based on the text, their press releases, is to reserve, take out some small subset of it, in this case, one fifth of the data, use that as a test set from the rest of it, which I, the rest of the data, which I use as a training set on which to train this classifier. And so I use the partisan labels of the press releases in my training set to predict the partisanship of those press releases in my test set. And I do this a bunch of different times, in, in fact, five different times, using different sets of the data as training sets and different sets as the test set. 
Again, this is a really stylized view of what this does, but essentially what it's going to do is across five repeats of this, across the five folds of the data, I'm going to come up with a predicted label of each mayor's press releases. And I'm going to do this a bunch of different times, in fact, a thousand different simulations of this five-fold procedure to get an individual level, so each individual mayor's accuracy, so how, how often their partisan label is predicted correctly. Overall, this approach is actually quite inaccurate, and so that's just something I want to highlight up front is compared to, uh, I guess, gold standard accuracy of, you know, we'd, we'd want 100% accuracy, we want them to be able to predict the partisanship of these mayors really easily, just under 75% are able to be predicted correctly um, across these many simulations. This holds true with SVM, with logistic regression, with, with lasso, um, so this isn't just specific to the approach that I'm using. Um, this also holds true when I do a variety of different pre-processing techniques on the text in terms of uh, stemming um, the area under the curve or the receiver operating characteristic curve is also pretty low. This is a, just another metric by which we can measure a classification algorithm like this, um, showing that we're not getting anywhere close to perfect classification. And this is in, in contrast to something like congressional press releases, where it's actually pretty easy to predict the partisanship of these uh, these government officials. So in local governments, participation or partisanship, excuse me, is much less easy to much less easy to predict. This is just a, a matrix showing you in terms of uh, who's predicted versus who's uh, actually a Democrat and a Republican. Um, but I want to move on to talking about the individual level accuracy, because this is where I think this gets really interesting. So across all of the simulations, each individual mayor has a level of accuracy with which their partisanship can get uh, predicted between zero and one. So zero being none of the time they're predicted correctly and one being 100% of the time they're predicted correctly across these many different iterations. And so I'm just going to plot along the x-axis here the probability of getting their partisanship correct across these thousand simulations and then the density along the y-axis. What we see is lots and lots of mayors are pretty easy to uh, to predict. There's a, uh, um, a a distribution here that's slanted towards the positive side. We see a lot of uh, a lot of these mayors being pretty easy to predict, but a lot of mayors are actually really difficult to predict as well. So there's this long tail towards the left. And so this, this varies across the different types of cities. So in San Francisco, Mayor Ed Lee, uh, after he's inaugurated in 2011, that mayoral term, he's really easy to predict here, almost 100% classification accuracy. Whereas people like San Jose's Mayor Reed, uh, and Houston's Mayor White um, are a little less easy to predict, getting getting their label of their partisanship correct less than half the time in the case of Houston's mayor here. So I next wanted to look at how does this individual level accuracy correspond with the electoral environment? What we know from theory is that if politicians are acting with their electoral environment in mind, we might expect that when they're more aligned with their constituency, they might behave in a different way from when they're less aligned. When they're more threatened by the electoral environment, they might have this incentive to behave in a way that's less partisan. And as Justin Grimmer would put it, more of the appropriators rather than position takers. But as I'm gonna put it, just less partisan because they wanna make it less clear. So what I'm plotting here is just the 2008 Democratic presidential vote share along the x-axis from uh, about 0.4 up to 1, and the probability of getting each individual mayor's partisanship correct across these many simulations. I've plotted each mayoral administration with a point here, blue if they're a Democrat and red if they're a Republican. What we see is for Democrats, so as they are in cities that are more Democratic moving to the right, the probability of getting them correct, getting their partisanship correct, goes up by a fair amount. So when Democrats serve in cities that are much more democratic, it's more, uh, it's easier to distinguish their partisanship than when they serve in cities that are less democratic, where their constituents are more Republican. And for Republican mayors, we actually just see the opposite relationship. When they're serving in cities with a more Republican uh, constituency base, they're easier to predict their partisanship. And when they're serving in areas that are more democratic, it's much less easy to predict their partisanship. The same pattern occurs when we look at their ideology based on the, the opinion um, across many surveys from the Tosanovich and Warshaw MRP uh, methods, which show that again, when politicians are more marginal, it's harder to predict their partisanship. When they're less marginal, when they're more aligned with their constituency, it's much easier to predict their partisanship. 
So just to sum up here, the implications that I think this has for accountability, essentially that while mayors communicate about public services, while they communicate about mundane local policies like street cleaning and sewer overflows, this could express local priorities in a way that gives voters information. But this type of communication is also strategic. And uh, we see that partisanship is much more easily distinguishable in electorally safe cities where uh, mayors are aligned with their constituency. Misaligned mayors, on the other hand, uh, are less partisan in their communication, doing this, this sort of behavior that I think uh, matches back to what we see Susan Collins do in a moderate state, where she communicates in a way that potentially is shielding her from uh, electoral punishment because of the votes or the policies that she's engaging in. So thanks. I look forward to your feedback. Thanks, Justin. Uh, and now we have Maria and Julia. One of you going to present? Yeah, I am. Okay, Maria. Hi, everyone. So I'm Maria Carreri. I'm an assistant professor at UCSD School of Global Policy and Strategy. And I heard that there's closed captioning going on. So I know from my teaching experience on Zoom that with my Italian accent, Zoom transcribes my word in the most imaginative way. So I apologize for <laughs> that. Uh, so today I'm presenting joint work with Julia Payson, my fantastic co-author, who I think today has set a record by having in the same conference both a paper and an entire book manuscript. And um, our title is What Makes a Good Local Leader? Evidence from U.S. Mayors and City Managers. So I want to start with the motivation for our paper, which I think is um, started from two main observations. So the first observation comes from the fact that the literature on political selection, the theoretical literature on political selection conceptualizes the idea of leader or candidate quality as the ability of leaders or politicians to do their job competently and honestly. However, when we test empirically these theories and have to operationalize the idea of politicians' quality, we often use the measures that are strictly related to human capital only. So we look at the education or the occupations of these politicians. The second observation instead has to do with the fact that a lot of what we know about local level politicians in the US comes from great work on these local leaders that, that however largely focuses on large cities in the US. And we know that 85% of municipalities in the US have a much smaller population of less than 20,000 inhabitants. And so these are the two gaps that we try to fill with this paper for which we collected novel survey data on US local leaders, both mayors and city managers for a representative sample of US cities. So what do we do with this paper? I think we do three main things. So the first thing is to paint a descriptive portrait of these 308 leaders that we interviewed across uh, uh, cities in nine US states. And for these uh, leaders, we collected information on the classic measures of quality that are used in the literature, measured based on their education and their previous occupation. But we also, and this is the second thing that we do with this paper, introduce two alternative measures of quality that we borrow from literature in uh, comparative politics, but also in public administration and management. And we measure the public service motivation and the managerial competence of these mayors and city managers. And I'll tell you more about that later, but we are able to compare these two alternative measures to the most commonly used ones. And together, I think we're able to tell a more complete picture uh, of these local leaders. On one side, because as I'll show you, uh, these measures uh, do not necessarily go in the same dimension direction. And so perhaps there are different dimensions of quality that we should take into account in our empirical work. But also we will see that cities with different characteristics elect different kinds of leaders. So this is largely a descriptive paper, but then in the third and last part of the paper, we also look at the effect that these traits of leaders have on city outcomes. And so we use a difference in differences design and look at the effect of these leader traits on change in population within cities. And so in this way, we also contribute to the growing evidence on the effect of leader characteristics for policies at the local level. <clears throat> 
Okay, so a few words about the original data that we collected. We conducted phone interviews with local leaders across um, cities across nine states in the US. So we interviewed two types of leaders, the mayors in mayor council cities and city managers in council manager cities in the US. We contacted 80, 890 of them and 308 accepted to participate in our study. And the population of interest here is all municipalities with at least 5,000 residents across these nine states. And the states were picked in order to maximize geographic variance subject to some big uh, uh, data availability constraints at the city level that I'm sure you're all familiar with, especially when it comes to smaller cities. So before showing you our descriptive results, I think it's useful to have in mind uh, how generalizable our descriptive findings are. And so here we compare the leaders of the 283 cities interviewed by us to the leaders that declined to be interviewed. And then here in this third column, we compare them to all other cities in the same states across uh, these demographic characteristics. And you see that our sample, those reported are T-stats, you see that our sample um, is a representative with the caveat that our cities uh, tend to be uh, more affluent and have a higher percentage of residents uh, with a college degree. So that's useful, I think, to, to keep in mind for later on. Okay. So what are the standard measures of quality that I mentioned earlier that we collected? The first one is education. We simply asked these leaders what's their highest educational attainment. But then we also asked them about their occupation. And with this information, we build a measure of occupational prestige. How do we do that? We classify their previous occupations into the categories provided by the US Census. And then we use data by NORC to assign a prestige to each of the different occupational categories. So to give you a sense, these range from um, in the US population, low levels uh, like 17 for a drug dealer to uh, high levels like 77 for a surgeon. Interesting to the audience uh, could be the fact that the prestige score of college professors is I think 69. Okay, so these are widely used measures, like I said, but there is a growing body of recent literature that is pointing at a series of issues with these human capital-based measures of quality. So recent work by Dalbo and co-authors shows that education, for instance, is only weakly correlated to cognitive abilities and leadership skills, traits that we all think as important for um, local leaders. Research by Nick Carnes and Noam Lupu show that education can be confounded by class, and I think the same is true with uh, occupational prestige. And so we embrace in this paper this view that to achieve a deeper understanding of political selection, we might need to go beyond the standard proxies for quality, such as education. And we do that by introducing two alternative measures. So the first one is that of public sector motivation. So you probably know of this measure as the Perry Public Sector Motivation Index is an index that measures an individual's motivation to serve the public. It ranges between one and five, and it was originally created and applied to bureaucrats, but it is increasingly being uh, measured for politicians as well, even though not in the US context, so which I think is interesting. This is mostly literature in uh, comparative politics. So what we like about this measure, among other things, is the fact that it is less likely to be confounded uh, by class. And also, as you will see later, it seems to tap into a distinct notion of politicians' quality. Then we also introduce a second alternative measure, the managerial score. This is a measure that Julia and I uh, focus uh, a companion paper that we have on US mayors and city managers on. But to give you a summary, the managerial score is meant to measure how competent uh, the local government leaders are as managers of the local government. And this is a measure based on work originally in management by Bloom and Van Rienen, who evaluate for managers along four distinct dimensions. And in the context of a local government, the meaning of these dimensions is the following. So target setting means how well does the politician set a target for his term in office? How well does she go about monitoring her performance and that of her government in reaching these stated objectives? 
Then for operations, we measure how knowledgeable they are about the garment, uh, the operations, the daily operations of the garment machinery. And finally, how well do they motivate and incentivize the bureaucracy? So a few quick uh, methodological things. This is a double blind survey methodology with open-ended questions along these four practices. They're scored in real time by an interviewer. And this uh, idea of managerial score has been applied in different contexts to study the managerial competence of hospital administrators, school principals, bureaucrats. And then to my knowledge, the first work to use this concept for politicians is my work on Italian mayors and my work with Julia on US mayors and city managers. So since this is a last known measure, I'll just show you very quickly what one of the questions looks like. Here we're asking open questions so that it's less clear what a good answer is. And then as the person is answering, an interviewer scores the answer using this scoring grid that you see here in gray that reports the criteria that an answer has to satisfy in order to get a score of one, three, or five. And then the middle score to be inferred by the interviewer. Okay, so now that we know what our measures of quality are, how do they correlate with each other? These are coefficients from bivariate regressions. And so we see that the standard measures, the occupational prestige and education, are strongly and positively uh, correlated with each other. And also the managerial scores, uh, the managerial score seems to get at a similar dimension because it is positively and significantly correlated. Interestingly, instead, Public sector motivation is not correlated to any of the other three dimensions, suggesting that it's tapping into a separate uh, um, notion of quality. Another thing that I think is interesting to look at is how these uh, four dimensions of quality correlate with ideology. So here, the way in which we measure ideology is to ask our respondents uh, for uh, their ideology on the standard very liberal to very conservative scale. And the excluded category in this table is the right leaning. And so we see that across the board, the left leaning mayors and city managers seem to score more highly along each of these dimensions. So I think this is interesting because it suggests that perhaps it could be important to account for these quality dimensions in studies of the effect of partisanship on a series of policies at the local level. Okay, so another thing that we do is uh, mm, to try and say something about uh, positive political selection. And I do not mean in any way positive in a normative sense. Positive in the literature on political selection simply refers to the sign of the difference um, between uh, politicians and uh, the general public along a series of characteristics. So here we're looking at um, occupational prestige. And I think it's interesting because from a theoretical point of view, it is not clear whether we would expect the positive or negative political selection in terms of occupational prestige or education. From a more labor market perspective, you would imagine that more educated people, people with more prestigious occupations would have higher outside options in the labor market. And so we would expect negative political selection. But if you also consider that entering in politics or, or pursuing a career as a city manager requires a very high startup costs, then we might imagine that you know, people that come from more affluent backgrounds will, will prevail and therefore we would expect positive political selection. And our evidence here, much in line with recent work in other countries such as Sweden, shows positive political selection at the local level in the US. We see that mayors uh, and city managers are much um, come from more prestigious occupations when we compare them to the general US public and less prestigious occupations when we compare them to members of Congress. And then a similar picture uh, comes up if we look at education, mayors and especially city managers are much more likely than the general US population to have a college degree. Okay, and then the, the second thing that we want to try and understand is where do these more high quality, if we can call them that, leaders that emerge? Are there specific city characteristics that predict the election or the appointment of these leaders? So we first look at how these city characteristics 
correlate with uh, the years of schooling of the mayor or city manager or the occupational prestige. And we see that on average, it is more affluent cities um, and also larger cities and cities that are more left-leaning that um, elect or appoint mayors and managers that are more educated or have more prestigious occupations. And here we measure uh, ideology by looking at the Bonica data and collapsing it at the city and election cycle level. So we look at the percentage of contributions that go to Republican candidates as a measure of the ideology of the electorate. If, however, we look at the correlates of public sector motivation and managerial score, a different picture emerges. So for public sector motivation, we see that if anything is a, a less affluent cities uh, that tend to select uh, leaders who score highly along this dimension. But again, we see that these leaders are more prevalent in left-leaning cities. With the managerial score, instead, we do not see any significant correlation aside from uh, a correlation, a positive correlation with population. So larger cities tend to select more managerially competent leaders. And you know, the difference between these correlations and these correlations on one side could suggest that they're tapping into different aspects of quality. It could also be due to the fact that Perhaps public sector motivation and managerial competence are harder to observe for the electorate during a campaign, so before the leader takes office, and this could be the reason for a lower correlation. Okay, and then finally, we turn to the question of whether these uh, uh, leadership traits correlate uh, with outcomes uh, that we care about. And here we decided to focus on population growth. So why? Well, population growth is can be considered a proxy for how desirable residents find the community. And we like the idea that it's a proxy for how desirable the community is, irrespective of your ideology and what exactly you're looking for in a community. Attracting residents is often considered a nearly universal goal for local officials. But of course, we want to note the caveat that you know, population growth is not an ambiguously positive. Population growth can also lead, in many cases, that does not necessarily decrease segregation or increase wages. But it's also interesting to see that among the leaders that we interviewed, 56% of them mentioned the population growth as one of their key priorities. And it's also important to stress that the likelihood of mentioning city population growth as a key priority is uncorrelated to their four measures of quality. So it seems to be the case that at least among our respondents, these are more universally desired um, outcome and it's orthogonal to underlying dimensions of quality. And, you know, often politicians uh, uh, subscribe to this view also outside of our sample. This is a carefully picked quote, of course, but the mayor of Detroit went so far as to say that the single standard that a mayor should be defined on is whether the population of the city is going up or down. Okay, so how do we look at the effect of these traits on outcomes? We use a modified difference and differences design it's mod in which we leverage the staggered natures of local elections in the US. So the fact that um, many cities in our sample are gonna elect or appoint the mayor or the city manager in a different calendar year. It's a modified difference in differences because as you've probably understood by now, we only interview the cross section of mayors and managers. But we are able to look at our outcome, so city population, also in the years preceding the election and the appointment of this person we interviewed. And so here we interact the leadership, one of the four leadership traits with an indicator taking value one for all the years subsequent to the election or the appointment. And we control for a rich battery of city level and the leader specific controls as well as the time varying measures of ideological preferences of the electorate, looking at campaign contributions. So I is the city or the leader, T stands for uh, normalized years. So we look at a plus minus five year window around the election or the appointment for which uh, 
the variable tick takes value zero, and J are calendar years. So we look at plus minus five years since the first election appointment of the person we interviewed. And so our calendar years uh, ranges between 1997, it's the earliest year in our sample, and the latest one is 2019. Okay, so just one more uh, methodological thing worth mentioning is that because of the modified nature of this difference in differences, we have one additional identifying assumption that's required in order to interpret our estimates uh, causally. And what this assumption requires is the absence of correlation in the leadership traits uh, between uh, the leaders that we interviewed and the predecessors. Um, whose leadership traits we do not observe because we did not interview them. However, we can test this assumption for a subsample of cities where we were able to interview two people, both the current leader and her predecessor. And so here I'm, I'm showing you a coefficient plot of the correlation between um, successor and predecessors along these four characteristics. And as you see, years of schooling is problematic because there is a, a positive and significant correlation, but it's not the case for uh, the managerial score, occupational prestige, and public sector motivation. So with this caveat in mind, we can look at the results. And here we see that um, when our outcome is the log of population, both public sector motivation and the managerial score have a positive and significant impact on population. So to give you a sense of how big this result is, a one unit increase in public sector motivation that ranges between one and five leads to a 2% increase in population or a one standard deviation increase in public sector motivation leads to um, around a 1% increase in population. And the effect size is similar for the managerial score. So electing or appointing a leader that's uh, um, higher in terms of managerial score by one standard deviation leads to an increase in population of around 1.6%. And you can also see here that the same is not true when our right hand side is education or occupational prestige. So it doesn't seem to be the case that these uh, two traits are translating into more uh, population growth. I think it's also interesting to notice how public sector motivation and managerial score, though not correlated, are having a same effect um, on population. So I'll spare you the detail of the parallel trends, but we can come back to that in the discussion if you want. Um, and I'm just going to conclude quickly. So what we do in this paper is to examine how mayors and managers across the US um, fair along the four possible dimensions of quality. We have two more standard measures, education and occupational prestige, and then we compare them to two um, alternative measures that we introduce, public sector motivation and the managerial score. And we show that public sector motivation seems to tap into a distinct notion of quality because it's not correlated to these other three dimensions. We show that there is positive political selection along education and previous occupation. Unfortunately, we cannot show the same for a managerial score for the managerial score or for public sector motivation because that data is not available for the general US public or for members of Congress. And then we also show that more affluent cities select local leaders that are well educated and come from more prestigious occupations, but it's, that, that does not seem to be the case when it comes to the managerial effectiveness of these leaders. And to conclude, we also look at the very end of the paper if these traits matter for uh, cities. We examine population changes before and after the appointment or election of these leaders that we interviewed. And we show that both public sector motivation and managerial skill predict population growth, while that's not the case for the two standard ability measures of education and occupational prestige. So to conclude, we see this paper as painting a descriptive portrait of ability measures of leaders across cities of all sizes, and also contributing at the same time to this debate around appropriate measures of quality of politicians. Uh, and we also contribute to the growing evidence on the importance of a leader's characteristics for city level outcomes. Thank you. All right, excellent. Thank you. Thank you both.
Uh, we'll now turn it over to Thad Kauser for discussion. All right. Great, thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, and I was just thrilled to have the opportunity to read papers by three rising leaders in local politics who are taking some of the same approaches to transform the study of local politics that, that the generation over the last uh, decade or two, uh, many of whom are represented here, have, have done to really make this field so much better. So, so each of these papers draws on larger literatures put, grounded in political economy, in comparative political economy, grounded in American politics, drawing from, from other fields in public administration. And they don't view local politics in the United States is completely sui generis, but they're bringing in both methods and theoretical ideas from a broader literature. Uh, and they're bringing in absolute uh, top-notch methodological skills. These are both clearly sophisticated papers, well-built models, well-explained. And, and in all of this, the most important move they're making is not just taking off the shelf data, right? But creating new and, and painful and time-consuming data collection uh, projects that, that, that truly advance this study and will advance their work in, in other work and, and, and the work by other scholars. So it's very much in the spirit of what people like Jessica, Liz, and John have done over the last generation. And so I want to um, give a few comments that, that both relate to, to these individual papers, but, uh, but then to some of the, the, the methods and the measures used that I know won't be used only in these papers going in this article, uh, but also more broadly. Uh, and, and I'd welcome some of the other people. It's wonderful to have uh, you know, some of the folks who've advanced this field more broadly to get into some larger conversations about how do we measure what good policy outcomes are in a local government. So, so I'll, I'll just throw a few things out there. Um, so first, Justin's paper, uh, which is the, the, the first that I've seen a look, and I'm sure it won't be the last, at this exciting data set drawn from, uh, from press releases. And, and it's wonderful to see this focus on political communication at the local level and to see text analysis used on something other than tweets, uh, which <laughs> so, so we have these, these bigger, longer chunks of, of text that I think give politicians more of a chance to give a robust sense of how they're presenting themselves to their constituencies. And, and, and so uh, I, I want to speak about two things. So first, I want to talk uh, a, a little bit about some of the some of the decisions, you know, both what I thought was clever, but some other directions to go in, in the text analysis that I think might allow uh, going back to your Feno frame, other uh, allow you to um, to capture the disparate effects of a few potentially politically strategic decisions in communication and, and separate out what's going on here, but also push you to think harder first in, in uh, through sort of research design and analysis strategies uh, in this paper, potential future ideas, uh, but just in general to speak to the normative question that you answer. I, I want to push you further to think about, to separate whether this is strategic communication by politicians who all have either sort of uniform public policy positions, they're Democrats or they're Republicans and they feel different things and then they're presenting themselves simply in different ways or whether different types of cities simply select different types of politicians, which I think is also another explanation of what could be going on here. So, so just to be clear, your frame is we've got red mayors and we've got blue mayors. And when you have a blue mayor in a purple city, they decide to present themselves through purple rhetoric. Same thing with a red mayor in a purple city. And, and that drives your whole theoretical normative framework, which you really push in the presentation here, which is that if we see people presenting themselves as purple, that that is bad for voters because it is obscuring their true inherent partisanship but I don't think without any external measures of partisanship, we don't have a way of, of separating that out. So it could be that it's simply that, uh, like, look, Susan Collins might actually be different than Lindsey Graham and, and others in the Senate, right? She, she may actually be intrinsically more moderate, and she's not a, a moderate, a partisan in moderate's clothing. She's actually just correctly showing uh, her, her true point of view to other politicians. Um, if you look at 
the politicians that are really driving this. So for instance, if you, if you look at, at, at your very nice, I, I like that you start with showing us all the raw data. I would like you to then move into regression context to, 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 to have a, a more complete text of this. But if you look at the raw data, what you see is this. You see, actually, there aren't any, in these big cities, there aren't any strongly safe Republican seats, right? There are competitive seats and between, it basically starts at 40% Democratic in presidential elections. In that realm of 40% to 60%, all Republicans kind of look the same. They're all pretty clearly identifiable as Republicans, right? The line for Republicans, the downward slope you see that as the city gets more Democratic leaning in presidential elections, you see more, uh, you see less clearly identified rhetoric that's all really being driven by these few Republicans who are in really democratic cities, right? And who are those people? Well, this is like Mayor Bloomberg in New York. This is like Dick Reardon in Los Angeles. And what are they like? Well, Dick Reardon was a different kind of politician. So I happened to work in the mayoral, the disastrous mayoral campaign to attempt to defeat him, where I worked for a Democrat who got walloped by a Republican in one of the most democratic cities in America. And the problem was that Dick Reardon was actually a pretty liberal person who, who had a series of positions. So he wasn't just faking it, right? He was very different. All right. So, so what are some, what are the ways that you could separate between strategic uh, communication and just being in, in just a selection effect. All right. One uh, sort of long term, and I think this is not for this paper, but for other projects, is to have a within politician design that when their political conditions change, they have uh, they have different incentives and they respond differently. All right. Cities move incrementally. Uh, uh, city boundaries change incrementally. What does change is what districts people run in. And there have been some nice natural experiments. So I just want to throw this out as potentially more broad uh, natural experiment that, that others could use, right? California is now undergoing this massive shift between at-large and district elections for city councils that has been brought by something fairly, by something somewhat exogenous, a state law, the California Voting Rights Act, the timing of which has been staggered across California cities and is based on some fairly as if random factors. So uh, the way this happens is first a lawyer brings a suit. There's a small set of lawyers bringing these for idiosyncratic reasons. So Kevin Shankman is the main lawyer who has brought this. He happens to be a resident of Malibu. Malibu happens to hate Santa Monica. So the, one of the first big suits that he brought was against Santa Monica. Rex Frazier is, Rex, sorry, Rex Fr Paris is another of these leaders. He's the mayor of Lancaster and Lancaster, they hate, they hate Palmdale. One of the first suits was brought against Palmdale. So we have this staggered at different times shift where politicians are having very different uh, constituencies going from 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 homo politically homogeneous city uh, sorry from a, a, um, a broader heterogeneous uh, at large district to a homogeneous city council district and we can look at how they change uh, their strategic communication for this paper really what you want to do is try to hold constant someone's inherent um, political position. How do we get that? Well, I think the roughest proxy we have for that is, is, is Adam Bonica scores that look at their, uh, uh, that, that, that locate them based on, uh, on their campaign contributions. We could have a much, uh, and I'd welcome the conversation with others about whether that's a meaningful measure in local politics. I have some concerns, but I think in this, you need to take seriously that, that alternative explanation of why people could be positioning themselves. Um, you need to be clear that you have cross-sectional data. So in your abstract, instead of saying when politicians partisanship and when they're misaligned, say where they are, because that's really how this is being identified. You know, caveat this appropriately. Um, secondly, on on your approach uh, to, 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 so one, I like that you're taking a supervised learning approach and you're taking a very clever approach here. So most supervised learning approaches have text. They have uh, coders, usually undergraduates who are trained to go out and recognize something and then they make a decision on this. Here, you're letting the subjects code their own text by calling, by declaring themselves to be Democrats or Republicans. Uh, and, and I think you're nicely leveraging that. Um, but I think here's what you could get that gets at some of your, your theory drawn from other realms. If you were to take that standard approach, and I think it would only, you'd only have to, to code from what we know, probably about 2,500 of these, which is not that easy, but not that hard. Hopefully there are some smart Harvard undergraduates or Kennedy School students you could put to the test, right? Which would be, there are two dimensions here that Fenno talks about when he talks about how people present themselves strategically. One is that you can build trust with voters by 
not talk not talking by saying that you are with them on policies or by saying that you're with them as as a person right and so you and he says specifically that when people are taught are, are in a district where most people don't agree with them on policy they talk about who they are and and the other attributes they share with people and so you can do in press release so first if you're doing all press releases about dogs that you've rescued from shelters that might be a strategic way to avoid controversial policy decisions. Um, and then you could then code the ideology of those policies when they do talk about policies that would be this, uh, that would get the same discrimination of, of, of liberal to conservative. So I have a paper on tweets in Australia that sort of does precisely this and found there's some conditions in which people shy away from politics and some where they just change whether they're on the left or right spectrum. All right, but but look, there there's a lot uh, to, to love about this paper and this project generally. Um, and I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, and then on Maria and Julia's paper, it was wonderful. Uh, Jeff, thanks for giving me the chance to come virtually to Los Angeles to get to know the work of someone across uh, the uh, a sidewalk um, from my home office uh, in San Diego. Uh, but but this is this is exceptional work that that really does incredibly hard work together. Original these two survey batteries drawn from from other fields and doing it on. A different sample. So rather than just big cities, we've got a big sample of, of uh, a big and broadly fairly representative sample of, of small to big cities. And that's especially useful here. Um, and, and I think the models are really well explained. The, the two things that I want to talk about, um, you know, I buy the modified difference and difference results here. I, uh, you know, I, I, the one thing that I'd like to see a little bit more of just technically, you presented a table here that was different than table four in the main body of the text. So some of my comments were, were gonna be about that and that main body of the text finds not quite significant results on your Perry index. And so I have a few ideas about ways to, to, to bolster that up. Um, you find in the, these results that you presented significant effects. Uh, so, so I just wanted to hear what the differences were there, um, but just briefly, with the Perry index, we have sort of very little variance. Part of that is there's some really clear, it's really clear what the right responses to all these questions are about. Are you there to value the city over your personal gain? Do you really like to, you know, people all that? It's really clear. And they're almost like asking people, are you a rent seeker or not? And so if, if you are dissatisfied with those studies and, and with, with that approach and, and want to find other ways to get at that, I could see two things. One, ask other people in city government about the top leader. And, and the second would be to look at comparisons of, you gather all this wonderful wage data, compare that to other wages in the area to see if someone really is motivated by public interest, if they're able to accept a wage deficit, I, that would be to me the strongest evidence that they really are truly motivated. Um, but. So I just wanna spend my last thing starting a conversation with both of you and with others about this measure, your dependent variable, which is the way to judge better cities is are they growing? And you say here that it's a nearly universal goal and you admit that it doesn't capture everything, um, uh, but, uh, but, but that's something that, every, that nobody dislikes, right? That nobody wants to oppose growth. Um, I buy that it's orthogonal to your three measures here. So this is not a critique of this paper, but just in general, as you go ahead, I, I don't buy that whatsoever. I think you are getting at one of the biggest flashpoints in local government controversy, right? Which is pro or anti-growth, right? It's what fractured Tom Bradley's coalition in Los Angeles. It's what you see fights about all over the Sun Belt. My tiny little town of Solana Beach is a slow growth city that I hate. I hate everything about that and what it embodies, but you know what? The politicians who have kept us at the same small population for a generation are doing exactly what their pivotal voter once and our mayor just ran unopposed and was elected overwhelmingly. So there are lots of places that want slow growth. Um, so so what what so clearly politicians and elites want different approaches to this. You sort of take you say, well, look, this is about consumer choice, right? If consumers are not moving there, that shows that the city's doing something wrong. If consumers are moving there, they're doing something right. Um, I think to fully make that consumer uh, argument, you would need to look at then, you know, let's take, let's spin out this analogy. You'd want to look like both what, what the size of the market is for that similar product and what price they are paying. So if you have 
two slow growth cities, but one you see property values constantly rising and the other not. I think that slow growth city where property values are constantly rising, that shows that people do, that there is consumer demand for that. So, so again, that's just throwing in, I think you, that's pretty good data that you could get, right, is, is, to, uh, is, is, uh, is real estate prices. The, the second thing is control for what's going on in that, the, the average rate of growth in that county over the same time periods. So are Moreno Valley and Yucaipa the best governed cities in America? I'm not sure, but their population has like moved by 10 X, right? They, because they're part of the Inland Empire, which is this area, you know, and then San Bernardino and Riverside counties in Los Angeles. And I'm guessing there are similar stories you could tell about, um, uh, about uh, what's that county in Northern Virginia that's grown like crazy. And so, so they're just areas that are growing. And the measure of a good city council would be, are they capturing the largest share of that growth? So relative to the growth in their county, which is an easily obtainable census data, are we seeing extra uh, extra additional growth and people paying an extra price premium? I would like to see this as you do more and more work on this. But but this is this is excellent work so far that all of you guys are publishing in the top places, and and I'm just really excited about the the next generation of, of leadership in local government. Excellent, Deb. Uh, before we turn it to some questions, do the authors want to respond? In any way to that? Those are just really, really fantastic comments. Ed. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that you you hit on exactly sort of some of the things that I'm I'm looking into as I grow this paper. This is very much like an in progress thing here. But then one of the next steps is unpacking what are these things that um, politicians actually talk about when they are misaligned, and is it as you said these these really unobjectionable issues about who they are as a as a person versus the policies and things they're doing as a person in government? So, um, I look forward to digging into that more. Thanks so much. I just want to thank you. Uh, all the comments are really helpful. Thank you for the great suggestions. So we will do that right away. I completely agree on all the points. And then just the boring thing is you were asking about the table. The table they were showing is actually the one that we have in the appendix because we receive comments that people prefer the one in which we were including the controls. And so, uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Okay, any questions? Hey everybody, uh, nice to see all your faces. I so wish we were in um, LA right now. We've got about <laughs> new snow on the ground here in Ann Arbor today. So uh, next year, Jeff, okay. uh, hopefully we'll be there in person. Um, I have comments for both authors. Um, first of all, Thad, really great uh, commentary. Uh, you hit on a bunch of points that I was making notes about as I was listening to the paper. So. Thank you for anticipating all of those. Um, first for Justin, um, uh, back onto this point of um, the heterogeneity in the press releases that are coming out of these cities. Um, you know, are, are there patterns of who's making, who's issuing these releases? So are individual mayors actually making the press releases or is it their city manager or is it their staff? Um, obviously, when a member of Congress makes a press release, she or he probably has her staff write it, but it comes out of her office. Um, and at the city level, I've certainly in my own community seen lots of press releases coming out of the bureaucracy that would be of the type like dog, dog available at the shelter, or don't forget that trash pickup is a day later this week, versus the ones that our mayor actually makes, which are much more political. So have you, can you look at that? Have you looked at that? Maybe I missed that in your presentation, but it seems like that would be one source of heterogeneity, who in the city is actually issuing the press release. And then before I um, pause, I just had another question for you, Justin, which is, do you see any differences after 2016? So the question is, has Trumpism seeped into city politics? And do you see any greater partisan posturing, particularly in Republican cities, but also maybe in Democratic cities to sort of distance themselves from Trump um, in the most recent period? So those, those are my questions for Justin. Maybe I'll stop and then if, I'll, I'll wait um, for the other uh, paper if other people have questions. 
Yeah, just really quick. Those are those are both great questions, Liz. Uh, so the who issues the press releases is such an important point that sort of was one of my starting uh, questions myself when I started collecting these data because you know in, in a city like Boston, it's all these different departments, it's all kinds of different things, and and across sort of all of these big cities, that's actually pretty true. Is that different departments are writing their own press releases, but the sort of truth that at least I found from my calling a bunch of these press offices in different cities, as well as mayor's offices to talk to them about their process of coming up with these press releases, as well as I've sort of sat down with, uh, I guess pre-pandemic sat down physically with people in the city of Boston to talk about this and like what the process is. And it's really interesting. It's, um, it is the, this sort of iterative process of approval that at least the way that I think of it is it may not be the mayor her or himself issuing the press release or writing it or their chief of staff or something, but it is definitely something that they get a, a layer of approval over, which I was a little shocked at. I, I would think like they don't need to approve something like a street repair press release, but these cities seem to be so concerned with the public image that they're putting out, they, they pretty universally have some form of approval that filters up. And so while the mayor might not be doing it, it is like some upper level administration official doing that. Um, so I, I do, I, I will agree. Though? I mean, I, I get that <laughs> and that's useful for your argument, but I do still think that something that comes out of the mayor's office versus something that comes out of the public works office, but that was stamp, that was checked off by the mayor might have a very different implication for representation. Yeah, in some of these cities, I've tried sort of teasing it apart by the department that, that puts it out and whether or not there is a department listed. But unfortunately, the sort of like, tagging of this with a like which department it comes from is really inconsistent across cities um so that's a that's a great idea to dig into more and probably would require a little bit more of like some some manual looking into who exactly is doing this at each city level over time um maybe i do want to see if the mayor is is named in the press release maybe see if yeah. the mayor's name is there that would be one thing that you could do with your existing machine learning procedure oh yeah Totally. I mean, it's just like, honestly, a really sort of simple thing is like, is the mayor in there or not? And I've looked at that before and it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. A lot of this, uh, the stuff where the mayor is particularly named is like specific things that are good that happen, like a new job center came to our city, which is really interesting. Um, I did want to briefly touch on your second point, which I thought was really interesting too, is like has Trumpism or national level uh, politics filtered into cities where we've seen a lot of resistance on the in policies actually to Trump administration policies. So things like sanctuary cities, um, uh, but also just like LGBT protections at the city level have been really uh, expanded over this time period relative to the national level. Um, and so I was really interested in, in both of those topics and looked into it. And I was shocked at how few cities are talking about these sorts of things. I um, One of the things that I found that was like a national level policy issue that appears in some press releases is stuff about like sustainability and the environment, another area where we see cities leading on, on policies. Um, but I, I really was shocked at how uh, low these uh, the prevalence of those sorts of topics was. So, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Maybe move over to Jessica. So I have uh, comments for, for both presenters. I'll try to make it short. So um, actually, I just want to follow up on what Liz was just talking about with Justin. So I used to work in the press office for the governor. Um, and so I have actually a lot of um, stories to tell you, Justin, about how that works. Um, so my job as a press aide was to look at all the press releases that my designated departments were going to send out and decide whether or not the governor would want to put his name on it or not, whether or not we would take it in the governor's press office or allow the department to send it out. Um, and about 80% of the time I got it right. And about 20% of the time I screwed up and approved them to send out something that turned out to be some horrible you know, mistake that I made. So anyway, we can talk about it more later. I can sort of tell you what the guidance was that I was given on how to make these kinds of decisions and how it actually operated. I know it's different in the governor's office, but maybe not so different. Mm -hmm. um, the other little point that I wanted to make is that your paper really made me think of an old literature. I think Bill Nelson is probably the person who has most written about this, but on the different types of black mayors. So he has this whole typology of black mayors, um, some of whom are managerial, some of whom sort of play to the center without race issues, some of whom um, really highlight racial issues in the city. And so, I, you know, I think you might get some 
leverage looking at that older literature and sort of trying to understand how different cities selected different kinds of black mayors and what they had to do once they were in office in order to keep their position. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's just a, something to look at. Um, on the um, on Julia and Maria's paper, um, I want to sort of highlight the point that Thad was making that growth is a good outcome. So I have some data suggesting that the preference against development is ba it's basically universal. So I have this big nationwide survey where I ask people about different kinds of development that they want, and it, it's a little bit different because I'm not asking development or no development, but I'm, I'm asking them what kind of development they want. And I, I wrote this survey to try to, to show that there was these subgroups that really want development of multifamily housing and they're not getting it. And it turns out I was completely and totally wrong. Basically 100% of my survey respondents want low density single family development when they're forced to choose development. So that, what that suggests is that when we do get development, it's not voters who want it, <laughs> it's elites, um, it's developers. And I, you know, I think Sarah Anzia's new book um, is, really points this out as well. So um, yeah, that's it. Go back over to Liz, you had a question for the, the second paper, Maria and Julia. Yeah, it's actually similar to what Jessica just said, no surprise. Um, uh, which is this issue about um, the extent to which managerial competence um, might be one of several um, signature features of a, of, of a given mayor. So um, Julia, um, I, I don't wanna um, uh, give away any secrets about your book that we're gonna be talking about later, but in that book, you did such an amazing job of illustrating and illuminating your quantitative empirical findings with examples. And so um, here's an example that might, um, might lead you in the direction that Jessica's talking about. So Detroit um, is a city where they've had by many uh, sort of uncontroversially um, low managerial quality mayors for a long time. Um, and then um, uh, in, I think, 2013, uh, Mike Duggan, who's the current mayor, was elected. Um, all the other mayors, they didn't, they didn't try to say they were competent because they weren't, but they were maximizing something else. They were really trying to maximize representation. And so um, I do think, and, and there's real value to that. I mean, you're likely to get different outcomes, but they may not be qualitatively worse from the perspective of residents. Um, and so I do think that allowing for um, heterogeneity across your mayors in what they're trying to accomplish, I think having this very like, do they have high managerial competency or not? really um, gives a limited picture about both what mayors are trying to do and also how and why they're selected. So like in Detroit, Duggan ran against a classic old school African-American, I'm one of you former sheriff um, of the city. And um, it wasn't, you know, I, I don't think this negates what you guys are doing at all, but it makes it seem like a more cut and dry measure of like good government. In fact, I think you even use the term good leaders in your title. And I do think like acknowledging both from the elected officials perspective, but also from the residents perspective of what do they need and what do they expect in their elected officials? It might be that in some of these cities where you don't have a ton of managerial competence, the city doesn't do very much. And so it really is about representation and they get most of their services from the county or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of examples, but I do think that backing off this sort of, um, and maybe I'm overstating the extent to which you represent it this way, but I do think that explicitly acknowledging that managerial competence is one aspect of good leadership, good governance, but there may be these others that are both important for citizens and for the elected officials themselves. Okay. Just very quickly, just because these are so helpful, you know, thank you to Thad and Jessica and, and Liz, this is so great. Um, Thad, we do have the Zillow housing price data and we were sort of unsure 
you know, which would be a better measure, you know, sort of full disclosure, we have these two papers, this companion paper that we didn't present here that's much more concerned with sort of identifying the effects of this managerial competence score on a variety of city outcomes. And then this paper where we're sort of saying, we have all this amazing data. We conducted you know, these 300 interviews, they're 45 minutes long. And in the other paper, we're, we're not exploring sort of the full range of, of data that we were able to capture through this process. And so you know, in this paper, we're sort of torn between not wanting to make it too much about outcomes while recognizing that no one cares about leadership traits in the absence of showing that it somehow matters for cities and residents. But one thing I want to point out is we have this, this amazing qualitative textual evidence of what mayors and managers say are their top priorities and say what they're doing. And so that might be one, you know, step where we can allow heterogeneity to come in because we were trying to think what would be a universal measure and you've all identified sort of the uh, problem with that approach. So yeah, I really appreciate the feedback. It's, it's well taken. I think, yeah, we'll think about it. Like it. Okay, well, we're exactly at time. So I think one of the things I've found about Zoom is that I can keep people on time uh, better somehow, um, or at least I'm two for two now. Uh, so let's take a 15 minute break and reconvene at noon for the third and final panel. Thanks everyone, another great panel.